How, what percent of the police live in the city? Five uh, percent or so. Five percent. So ninety-five percent don't live in the city. Yes. So when you say that the vast majority of the percentage goes towards salaries, etc., yes, fringe benefits, that means that they take their money on eighty-one, go to outside the city, pay taxes in those communities that have some of the best schools while we have an underfunded school district. $60 million up. So I just want to put into context what we're talking about because it's really easy to say, Mayor, and with all due respect, I like you, but that was a very politician answer. What, I'm it's, sorry, what specifically? The, the, we will consider and we will look. What, I'm, what, I'm, what we're saying is we're not interested in considering and looking. What we're saying is actually there's 50 million, commit to 20 million cut. Right. Because we're sending money as the mayor of Syracuse. When you don't have a tax base, you're sending money out of Syracuse. And not just for 30 years, for the rest of their life. Because their pensions, their health insurance, their families. So we are funding for other people's communities to have the promise of the American dream while we are denying it in our community. That's the context that you as the mayor have to look at this under. So when we talk about renegotiating union contract, what we're saying is you can't play around with maybe um, we will, no, y'all gotta go because you don't provide a service that is beneficial to the community, that is meaningful to the community. The services that you provide criminalize our community, impoverish our community, reallocate resources to suburbs. We are actually funding the suburbs, both in our police department, and in our schools. And to be clear, just to be clear, it's not just the fact of like the percentage of people, we're also funding what race of people on the police force. The percentage of race of teachers as well, superintendent, board president. So we want to put in context because it's not just a class issue, it's a race issue. This is, this is what we're seeing right now with the NBA, some of these sports leagues. The WNBA, I think, doesn't get enough credit in this. I mean, they have been extremely Absolutely. vocal going back for years before this. And I heard some of their players talking while the NBA players were protesting. And they're discussing, you know, the highest paid player in the WNBA makes just under $200,000 a year. So they're saying if we have to step away from this, if we have to lose our contract for this protest, we might have to be ready to go do something else. And, that's and actually, they, they, many of them have. Right? Yeah, so Maya many, Moore. Exactly. And I, I think I, I'm happy that you started with the WNBA because oftentimes black women are ignored and are kind of not recognized. I mean, if you look at the ways with which um, it, I don't want to do tragedy Olympics, but if <laughs> yeah. you look at the ways with which there's been a significant amount of attention on the deaths of black men, the very little justice, if justice at all, for Breonna Taylor. Um, the fact that we've learned in the news that the district attorney is actually trying to get her ex-boyfriend to claim that she was engaged in criminal activity just to justify their extrajudicial killing of her. I mean, it's, it's amazingly atrocious. Can you get the into race. a little bit? Can you get into that Brianna Taylor case a little bit? Because we're 171 days out, no arrests, no movement at all, and I think that confuses some people. Like, wh it's, why is that? It is disgusting, and it's this is why I do not call it the criminal justice system. Because if you think about her case, there's nothing just about this, and it's it's also why we talk about these issues as an ecosystem. Because what is often underreported is that the neighborhood that she lived in was a neighborhood that was becoming gentrified. And the more that it was becoming gentrified, the increasing presence that law enforcement was needed to keep the, the new um, incoming community members feeling safe. And it's so important because we see this pattern around the country. We see it in Syracuse, right? So Syracuse is going through a shift. Downtown Syracuse is going through a rebirth and has been going through a, a renaissance for the last 10 years or so where Apartments are like $3,000 a month, where the occupancy is like almost 100%. It's like 99%, where the median income is like $100,000. If you go a few blocks away, the median income is like $20,000. And what we're seeing is as, as there's an expansion in downtown Syracuse, as, as it becomes gentrified, um, the presence of surveillance cameras and the presence of police officers and the presence of police stations in those areas are increasing. And you saw the same thing in the case of Breonna Taylor. And so as law enforcement comes into her home, as she is sleeping, 
a first responder, a woman who is aspiring to just be a successful human being, the kind of dreams that we all dream of, to the dreams of being a mother, perhaps, the dreams of being a successful, self-fulfilling, self-sustaining woman, the dreams of being loved and married, the dreams of being able to start a family of her own, the dreams of being a being um, were snuffed away from her um, for sleeping in her bed through a no-knock warrant where the officers barged in the home, shot up dozens of bullets that wound up shooting her, her boyfriend at the time, not knowing what's going on because no one announced that they were there. No one announced they had a warrant. No one announced that they were, that they were law enforcement and was getting fired and was firing back on them, was arrested. Brianna winds up dead. Innocent, killed, no justice for her whatsoever. And not even her memory is being honored in the way that it should be. Not a recognition of, of, the, of, of, of the fact that this life is gone. And it's, it's, it's completely untenable. And so it's not the first instance of, of a black woman whose life has been snuffed away. Um, you know, you can be black and sleeping, you can be black and walking, you can be black and jogging, you can be black and driving, you can be black and in a suit, you can be black and a professional, you can be black and homeless. The greatest indicator is the fact that you are black. And that's what is, what ties all these cases together. Um, and so it's, it's with a heavy heart that we see there has been no justice for Breonna Taylor. The news cycle has shifted to other issues. The, the, the trends have kind of let her story get, you know, kind of further and further wiped out into the, 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 the annals of, of Twitterverse. Um, and, and we see, but not for the fact of the WNBA and others who continue to uplift her name and to say her name or recognize her, that we would have lost attention. So I think it's important to uplift the WNBA and women of the WNBA for making sure that we don't lose her story. Yeah, and I wonder what the impact of that NBA protest, the WNBA, pushing the conversation around that. I find it so interesting. I'm in the sports world, so I cover these things, and it seems like so much of society looks to the entertainers, to the athletes, to these people at high levels of attention, to talk about these things, to do something about these things. And I, I found it interesting in the protests on the NBA, NBA side, Fred Van Fleet saying that these organizations, which are multi-billion dollar organizations, could use their pull in the communities, could use their money in the communities they're in, especially in Wisconsin when we talk about Jacob Blake, to pressure change here. But the protest ends after a week. Didn't get any direct commitments of that kind, at least that were out there publicly. And sort of go back to this. So there's an awareness to this that I think is positive, but do we put too much on athletes, on entertainers, on, you know, celebrities in general on these things, especially you as someone who, um, you know, is doing the work on the ground or is, is it just useful to have that um, message out there anyway? I think it's tremendously important that their activism occurred in the moment that it did. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't, not everyone can be marching in the streets every day. Not everyone can be deeply involved in policy analysis. Not everyone can be litigators and suing in court. Not everyone can be giving a speech or having a discussion on a podcast. People can do what they can do in their faculties and their capacities and with the power that they have. And with the power that they have, they did bring attention to this issue. Perhaps there could have been more change that could have happened. Perhaps there's more that needed to go on but they did something important and historic. And I don't, I don't want to undervalue what that is and what's to say that their work is done. Yep. You know, the, the shift in conversation has occurred. And it wasn't just WNBA and, w, and NBA. It was Major League Soccer. It was Major League Baseball. It was the most historic sports event um, in, in the sense of, of social justice consciousness. Um, Tremendous power. Um, and I think what they were doing in taking the strike is saying, if you don't begin to shift things, you're going to see that we're going to walk away. Um, and now the ball is in the court, so to speak, of the owners. What are the owners going to do? Uh, because it's, it's their obligation as well. It's not, it's not just on the black bodies to elevate these issues. What are white people going to do in positions of power? 
what are others in positions of power and authority going to do to speak out about injustice? You know, to, to, to say that this is not okay and to do something about it. Um, and so I just, I wanna acknowledge that the, there was a tremendous import and value add. You know, it did continue to give energy to the issue um, and, and, and help to continue to sustain the momentum um, at a point that was really essential and necessary. And I, I don't want to undervalue that. I think it's really tremendous and important. Uh, there's obviously more work that can be done. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope that they do continue. And if they want to talk, we can figure out some things together. Um, but I, I really do think that it was an important contribution to, to history and to this moment that we find ourselves in today.